welcome to All Sides with Ann Fisher. Once the cornerstone of the Industrial Revolution in the U.S., coal has lost its appeal as cheap oil and natural gas and cleaner coal from the West take its place. Coming up later, we're going to talk about the impact of coal on the history of Ohio and Columbus. Right now, we're looking at the efforts by the Trump administration to turn back the hands of time by overturning Obama-era regulations, including the stream protection rule. Joining us uh, is Washington, D.C. correspondent for High Country News, Elizabeth Shogren. Welcome back, Elizabeth. Great to be here. So we just heard that uh, President Trump is headed to Ohio on Thursday to sign the stream to sign the repeal of the stream protection rule. Can you explain what it did, why it was enacted, and and what's happened? Okay. Well, the stream protection rule was a, a rule that was written by the Obama administration, and they worked on it through much of that whole eight uh, eight year period. I think it was under under underway for seven years. And the, the idea was to try to reduce the pollution that comes into streams from uh, surface coal mines, largely. The office of, um, one of the offices of the Interior Department was the one who wrote this rule, the Office of Surface Mining. And, and so um, it, what it required is monitoring of the water quality in streams and also different setbacks for how um, how far back um, uh, pollution had to be put from from getting into streams. And this um, rule was very controversial with the coal industry, in large part that the, um, the coal industry, especially on the east but across the country, has been really suffering in recent years, and the, the coal is, coal is um, production is down dramatically in App- Appalachia. It's down um, more than 50% since um 2008, when President Obama became president. Is it because of Obama-era policies, though, or does it have more to do with the price of oil and natural gas or a combination of both? The, it would be wrong to say there was no impact from President Obama's regulations, um, but the, by by far the largest impact on coal downturn has been from the low price and abundance of natural gas that, um, that, that, that's available through, throughout a large percentage of the country. There's a lot of natural gas production going on, and that huge uptick in natural gas production, which was spurred by something called hydraulic fracturing, basically took place during President Obama's um, time in office. And so you see that huge surge in production happening of, of natural gas and the prices have been very, very low. And um, at that time, a lot of, um, most of the coal in our country uh, that's produced in our country is used for electricity, electricity, nearly all of it. Mm -hmm. And so what was happening during that time is that um, uh, utilities across the country that produce electricity were opting for natural gas instead of Coal and one of the and some of the reasons that we're pushing that them in that direction were rules that President Obama did um, put into into effect that were about cleaning up toxic air pollution from coal-fired power plants. That includes methane. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not methane. That includes um, mercury and other toxic air pollution, pollution and um, and other rules um, that that did have a um, an impact of reducing the demand for coal. But the biggest impact, again, came from the the abundance of natural gas due to fracking. You've written that the biggest contradiction in Trump's energy plan is to revive the coal industry while also boosting natural gas production. Is it impossible or is it unlikely that both industries can prosper? That's what nearly all the experts, um, you know, the independent experts I've talked to Day. The, the problem is that um, our country, uh, the demand for electricity is slowly, it is not um, growing rapidly. So there's not a bigger pie, basically. It's basically the same size pie, and that's because of all the energy efficiency that's been going on. And that's, um, you know, that's good um, at, for a country that produces um, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions at a time when, um, when our, our world is heating up dramatically, which is 
causing lots of problems for our world and for our country. So, and I'm talking about um, climate change here. Mm -hmm. And so, what what you've got a situation where there there is energy efficiency going on, so that the the pie of electricity, um, how much electricity we need nationwide, is not growing very dramatically. So, you, you divide up that pie, and for most of the last decades, coal has been the biggest chunk of that pie. It's only um, starting. Um, uh, well, last year was the first whole year when natural gas produced natural gas produced more electricity in our country than coal. Um, so that's that that switch just happened, and um, and that um, um, uh, so um, with you, unless natural gas prices shot through the roof, there's there's a um, there's a likelihood that natural gas will continue to um, to attract a lot of the production of electricity in our country. And and for one thing, what's going on right now is companies are building even more natural gas plants across the country. And you've got decisions being made across the country um, uh, to, um, to close down old coal-fired power plants, in part because of pollution requirements, mm-hmm. some of which were on the books way before Obama was president, but also um, because of this problem that natural gas is abundant and cheap, and it's not a problem, but, you know, of this reality. And the other thing that's happening is there, there are more renewables, more solar and wind being used for electricity in our country, and that's also having a, an impact on coal because the, the cost of producing uh, electricity from wind and solar has been plummeting. It's, it's a lot lower than it used to be, and so they're, comp- they're out-competing coal, too. The president will visit Ohio for the first time as president. Uh, he'll be in Youngstown on Thursday to sign a bill that Republicans believe can help the faltering coal industry. The Columbus Dispatch reported that uh, late earlier this hour. Uh, my guest right now is Elizabeth Shogren. She's at Washington, D.C.'s correspondent for High Country News. We're talking about uh, the coal business in the United States right now. Coming up, we're going to talk about the history of coal in Ohio and Columbus. Um to what extent, even if it all came back and they were producing the same amount of coal and they could produce the same amount of coal in Ohio, to what extent would a lot of those jobs be replaced, do we know, by mechanization? Isn't isn't that a big issue as well? Uh, well, that's a very good question. In, in fact, um, there has been a dramatic shift in mining in recent years where the mines that are the most efficient, um, that have, um, uh, they use, the, the fewest people um, for the the mining um, are the ones that are doing the best. If you look across the country and see what's happening in coal, if you look at the Energy Information Agency just um, uh, earlier this month came out with new projections of what they expect to happen with coal in the coming um, the coming months and couple of years or in the next year. And one of the things that they say that could happen is there could be an uptick in coal production in the West, but they do not expect an increase in coal production in the East or in the central part of the country. And um, when you look to the West, where um, the Powder River Basin is the source of most of the coal, mostly it comes from Wyoming, but also from Montana and other places. So most of that coal is produced in huge, massive surface mines. I've been been there. I've seen them. They have, um, and they, um, you know, they scrape the coal off the surface and they put it into huge trucks and put it onto trains and it goes goes to market. So that's not providing the kind of coal mining jobs in Ohio that you're talking about. And the kind of coal that they're mining in the Powder River Basin is much different than the coal that comes from Appalachia. Uh, that's right. It is different. Um, it has. Um, it's not quite uh, as powerful as far as energy is concerned. Yeah. Um, but it. But it is. Um, but it is also um, cleaner. So uh, it. it it got a big upsurge when um, the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments were put into place. So the, we're we're going way back here, yeah. and um, but that but that's one of the things that over time has made it harder and harder for Eastern coal to compete. But also the prices are just really a lot lower for that coal than they it's are. It's cheaper to get to it, right? Coal. It's much cheaper to get to it. Imagine it's just you know a big huge. Um, a big, huge open field, basically, and they dig and dig and get from one seam to the next, and they just and, and it doesn't cost very much. It's very mechanized, and there aren't a lot. I mean, there are jobs for sure, and mm-hmm. those uh, the 
um, I've been to those areas, um, and jobs in uh, jobs are declining there too. It's not just in Appalachia where coal jobs are hurting, mm-hmm. and those people are, um, and you know, there are jobs, but just not as many jobs for the for um, as for the coal production. And the other thing that's happening is, of course, even underground mining is um, being mechanized. So those those coal jobs are never coming back. I thought it was really interesting during the campaign. I did a story that was similar to the one that um, that you're talking about, and um, because uh, you know the president uh, now President Trump's rhetoric on the campaign trail was about this about saving the coal industry, and I thought it was so interesting that um, uh, Robert Murray, the um, a coal industry CEO, told um, out of Cleveland, Trump, yeah. He told Trump from yeah from Murray Energy Corporation, and he has mined in Utah, Ohio, Illinois, Kentucky, and West Virginia. He told Trump um, uh, during the campaign um, that it was uh, quote not possible to bring back the mines, and um, and he he um, he he told this to an industry research company, and um, he said, "I don't think." It will be a thriving industry ever again. The coal mines cannot come back to where they were or anywhere near it. That um, that quote he didn't tell me. He told um, S and P Global Market Intelligence. But I thought that that really helped to encapsulate this because sometimes um, there's this uh, this there's a lot of skepticism in our country right now, and you have one side saying black and the other side saying white, and it's very hard to say, well, what's the truth in here? Like, for instance, with this stream buffer zone rule that the president is going to sign, mm-hmm. everybody's going to say, everybody who who um, who supports President Trump and, and the Republicans on the Hill will say, well, this will help bring back the coal industry again. Well, that rule hasn't even gone into effect yet. So any problems that the coal industry has up until now are not because of that rule. And so you can't see that somehow um, getting rid of it, which, sure, could help the finances of the coal industry, don't get me wrong, but those, um, but those, um, those impacts haven't even been felt yet. So it's hard to say that somehow the coal industry would be revived by this rule. What else? By getting rid of this rule, I'm sorry. That's okay. What else are they doing in Washington, the Republican-controlled Congress and the Trump administration, what else do they have up their sleeve? What else are they looking at to benefit the coal industry, at least as it would affect, you know, Appalachia and Ohio? Well, you know, there's a lot that we don't know yet what will happen. I mean, one of the things that's very clear is that um, President Trump has said that he does not want the clean power plan, which was the rule that President Obama uh, Obama's EPA crafted in order to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants across the country, and that rule um, that rule has also not gone into effect yet. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been stopped or stayed by the Supreme Court while they're trying to figure out if it was legal or not. So that's another um, thing. That's a big thing that. Uh, President Trump wants to do to help the coal industry. Again, that would that's mostly about um, the future. Uh, w- it would ease um, ease the pain on the margins for the coal industry on the future. But some of the directions um, that are, but but that's not going to take away this major threat to coal, which again is natural gas, and to a, le- a lesser extent, a very um, low price renewables. And one of the things that's happening with um, with renewables, that's really important to remember is that at least for the more the the western part of the country than your your region for sure. But there are states with very strong um, renewable energy requirements there. And while in the east, you've seen it happening, for instance, with New York. And once a state decides that they don't want to have coal anymore, or they want to have renewables instead, or a very large percentage of renewables. That rule doesn't go away no matter what President Trump does. And so the states can have a huge impact on the demand for electricity and not just, um, and not just the federal government. It's largely a state by state, state, um, energy is, is an industry that's much more influenced by states than it is by the federal government. Elizabeth Shogren, thanks for joining us again. I appreciate your time. 
Uh, it's been great. Thank you. Elizabeth Shogren, Washington, D.C. correspondent for High Country News. Coming up, we're going to look back in time uh, to the history of coal in, in Columbus and in the state of Ohio. This is All Sides with Ann Fisher on 89.7 NPR News. This is 89.7 NPR News. Join us at noon for fresh air and a look at how advertisers track our shopping behavior from noon until 1. Donald Trump has officially begun his term as president. 2017 will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. And there are lots of issues on the table, including health care, education, and the economy. As the nation transitions in the first hundred days, NPR will be there with coverage and analysis that you can depend on. Listen every day. On 89.7 NPR News. School funding numbers in the governor's proposed budget are changing by the day, and state lawmakers apparently are not impressed anyway. What to expect going forward with how your schools are funded by the state? That's Tuesday on All Sides with Ann Fisher from 10 to noon on 89.7 NPR News. Support comes from listeners and from Ohio State's Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, presenting the exploration of Pluto with the leader of NASA's New Horizons mission, Alan Stern. Open to the public, February 15th at COSI. More at ccapp.osu.edu. Welcome back to All Sides with Ann Fisher. Coal was first mined in the Hocking Valley of Ohio in the early 1800s and helped fuel the Industrial Revolution. A new book has been published about the role of coal in the development of Ohio and Columbus. The book is entitled Carrying Coal to Columbus, Mining in the Hocking Valley. Joining us now are co-authors Elise Myers-Walker and David Myers. Welcome to the show, Elise. Thank you. And David, welcome back. Thank you, Anne. And your other co-author is Nyla Volmer. Correct. Yeah. Who lives in Haydenville. Yes, she does. She's the keeper of the flame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone doubts the importance of coal to Ohio, they should know that the United Mine Workers of America was founded in Columbus in 1890. How do you summarize the impact of coal on the state? Uh, I'm sorry, um, yeah, um, I I don't think it can be underestimated. <sighs> honestly, I think um, you know Ohio, by virtue of its physical location in the United States, has always been sort of a crossroads. Has always been sort of a place where um, the the high tech that was originally out of the East Coast met sort of the um, ingenuity and explorer spirit that was in the West at the time. And and you know. When you have those two energies coming together and you have new technologies like steam uh, was a particularly big one. The railroads were huge. Ohio was just really well positioned to take advantage of that. And then, of course, with um, a natural element like coal, you also have to have the abundance of the resource to play a big part in it, too. So um, coal was huge for Ohio. I, like I said, I don't think you can underestimate that. I My understanding is we're still getting 59 percent of our electricity from coal in the state. So mm -hmm. I think it still is very big to Ohio, just in a different way than it used to be. It made creating other industries a lot easier, having the easy access to coal, right? Yeah, that that's when the deeper we got into this, that's what really struck me is this kind of this whole pageant that unfolded. Because uh, we went in particularly looking at coal, but then we kind of dropped back and started looking at, well, the manufacturing of iron. We have, you know, these remnants of these furnaces scattered throughout you know, southeastern Ohio. And I never thought much about how those operated. Originally, they used charcoal for the heat right. source in those. And, but these guys, they were around at you know, the beginning of the 1800s making iron in these remote areas. And they'd have crews of as many as 100 people working with those things out in the middle of nowhere. And you know, eventually, they converted over to coal. But they located it there because... They had access to lumber, trees, to turn into charcoal, and there was clay 
so they could build their furnaces and they had iron ore. And so that was kind of the starting point. And when I, you know, being located in Columbus and, uh, and, and most of my books are focused on Columbus, Columbus centric, I was really kind of intrigued by how the, these visionary individuals in Columbus were the ones who saw the potential of all these mineral deposits throughout the Ohaking Valley and how they use those to build Columbus into the city it is. You know, without coal and iron and clay, Columbus wouldn't be here. Without the Haydenvilles. Without the Haydenvilles, Absolutely, yes. yeah. Yeah. Right, and because Peter Hayden, who started that, lived in Columbus. Well, yes, he did. And he wasn't from here originally. Right, from but, New York. Yes, well. but he had a huge operation, I mean, that he ran from Columbus. I mean, he was across the entire country. He started out in New York. He was the one that introduced prison labor in Auburn, came to Columbus really fascinating, specifically yeah. because of the Ohio Penitentiary, mm -hmm. so he could use prison labor, introduced prison labor in, in uh, California, and built all these different industries around that throughout the country. And he saw potential in Haydenville, originally thinking he would use it for coal mining, but then he discovered the clay deposits, figured he could buy coal and built this town to make, you know, brick and tile. And, you know, Claydenville, which is Nyla's hometown, is near and dear to my heart because it is the only place I know of where you can go and actually see a company town and kind of envision what they look like. Right. The company and, store still stands yeah, there on Main Street, actually. Right, and all the houses, are were a lot of them were built to show off the company product. Right, oh. yeah, they're built out of clay and tile. And the church, the particularly, church, yeah. you look yeah. at it and see these sewer tiles are used for decorative functions in the in the sides of the churches. So, you know, you see that, I, you know, I had to dig in deeper and learn about these people. And you go in, you know, you think there's going to be heroes and villains in this story like there usually is but i find there's there's many more heroes than there are villains in the history of coal in, in ohio you're listening to all sides with ann fisher on 89.7 npr news we're talking with co-authors elise myers walker and david myers their book is called carrying coal to columbus mining in the hocking valley now if you're listening and you grew up around this in the Hocking Valley, if you grew up around coal mining in Appalachia and have a story to tell, please give us a call, 614-292-8513, or email us at allsides at org. Now, coal, even though Ohio coal is now seen as dirty coal and is expensive to burn because of you know of its properties it was so valuable that they started returning referring to it as black diamonds now that's valuable yes yes that wasn't just a fr frivolous reference it was serious and the number of people who made fortunes off of this kind of striking you know and many of them are buried here in green lawn cemetery we even put a chart in the back because so many of them were you know made their their money here and, and were buried here um I see that the, but the you know they called it black diamonds, but it also is was dangerous. You know, the mining has always been dangerous, and they didn't realize as much at that time that there were different uh, uh, coal came in, in different quality mm -hmm. levels. And Ohio is known as high sulfur coal, and that became one of the factors. You know, when they started competing with other coal mining operations, and that's the part of the story I think that kind of gets left out because you think of these mine owners who come in and all they do is exploit the workers. And it wasn't quite that way because they had their own competition they had to face. And that really becomes clear when you hear of, you know, like in the, the old uh, song, 16 Tons, uh -huh. Oh, My Soul, the company store. Well, there were company stores here. And in some cases, that's all that uh, enabled the mine to survive. They were losing money on the actual coal sales. It was only from what the miners were then paying back into the stores that the operations were allowed to con or enabled to continue because they because of the competition, you know, competition from Pennsylvania, from uh, Illinois, from Alabama, you know, where labor might be cheaper, where the, the coal may be a higher quality, where transportation wasn't as far. Those were all variables that they had to weigh when they determined how much to pay their workers. A thing that struck me, too, is, like he said, you think about the company store and this big, big coal, big, 
barons and that. And what was interesting is how for a while it was actually kind of a cottage industry. Um, families would have their own mines that they would dig out and actually it would just be down in the basement of their house. And so every day, you know, whoever in the family, I'd say dad, but it might be mom, it might be the brothers, would go down into the mine in their basement and pull out the coal. And actually, um, a woman by the name of Ida Mae Stahl was um, Ohio's official first and only female coal miner. Um, she was... Uh, originally, they tried to prohibit her from mining coal. They said, this isn't a thing a woman can do. We have laws against this. And it was determined that because she had dug the mine herself, they really couldn't stop her. Um, and even though, again, it was not a thing that you could legally do So, as a woman. But that that's the part that really interests me is it's, oh, it's the family's coal mine. It's just over there. And they're working it in that manner and in a very, I said, cottage sort of industry way there. I heard about this before, but um, you reminded me in your book that coal was literally being mined in backyard gardens in Hocking Hills. And that was the first big one or the first one where they were able to uh, mine enough to make a difference for one of the furnaces. Um, and it was his, and guys, some, his backyard. Well, they had a, a, a guy came to Columbus named John Lorimer Gill. And he wanted to make uh, cast iron stoves. And so he did that by using the, you know, one of the local iron furnaces. It wasn't all that local. He had to go 30 miles away or so to get the, the pig iron. But he cast these things, and then he tried to sell them. Well, he soon had exhausted Columbus, so he started hauling these stoves down to Athens by horse and wagon. And as he was passing through Nelsonville, he went by a, a blacksmith, and noticed that the blacksmith was digging up coal in his garden. <laughs> and so instead of taking the wagon back to Columbus empty, he decided he'd get it filled with coal. And that was the first coal shipment to yeah. come to Columbus. <laughs> that was in 1830. And people recognize this is really good to have, but hauling it by wagon just wasn't feasible. Fortunately, the canals came by within a couple of years, and that way you know, it only took you a couple of weeks to get the coal up from you know, the Hocking Valley. The canals are something that are, we talk about, everyone's heard of the Erie Canal, but when you actually go to where some of the old canals, some of the surviving sections of the canal, and there are very few, it's amazing that they were ever even built. There's a park in Haydenville that has a right. section of one. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that's something we kind of take for granted because you see remnants of the canals in you know, the Miami in uh, Ohio, Erie, all over Ohio. But, you just think about the effort that went into digging those by hand and then maintaining them and, you know, and just the engineering that was involved, you know, in, in raising and lowering the Did the, the government boats. do that? It, it was done through a, a private enterprise. Uh, so you, you had um, a person whose name escapes me at the moment, but here in Ohio that, that really ramrodded the whole thing and got it financed and went into Hawk himself in order to get the thing accomplished. But it was businesses that were doing it. In in its heyday, how, how many company towns were there in Ohio? Oh, good question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, there, well, it, there's, it, you know, there's so the many that are... Diamond that are the more prominent yeah. ones. Yeah, and, that, and that's only in the region. You know, we're looking basically at a three-county region. But the thing that's just amazing to me is these are towns that came into existence and may have endured for 25 years and then disappeared. And one of our favorites is Sand Toy. Sand Toy was found around uh, 1900. By 1931, it was abandoned. And this was a town that was, the population was probably about 4,000 at its peak, had the only hospital in Perry County, had you know numerous bars and stores, had two huge mines, and go try to find it. You know, the most you can find are some foundations hidden out in the woods. And you know, a overgrown. sign on a church. Yeah, a sign on a, a church that stems from later, but it's they're they're just gone. And this, the others are just the same way. You drive around looking for them, and you see photographs of these huge brick buildings that no longer exist, and there's no sign that. You know, they, they, there was ever anything there. It's just they've all been reclaimed by nature. Yeah, Santoy had um, the biggest buildings in the county, the tallest buildings <laughs> in the county. And, it was, I mean, this is a formidable yeah. 
town we're talking about here. Just you, yeah. you would drive right past it now because it's woods. But you know, basically, in a, a generation or two, they they rise and fall and they're gone. You were asking about the number of, of towns. Mm -hmm. uh, what we can say is that there were um, probably upwards of fifty thousand workers at mm -hmm. the beginning of the twentieth century. Century, and so that's the workers and their families yeah. in these towns. So you can imagine how many people were involved in this endeavor. Uh, it's just massive. Yeah, and the reasons for the you know the company towns was the fact that these locations were so remote that the the owners had to build something for the people to live in. Now, in the case of Nelsonville, it already existed before they started the the mining there, so it wasn't necessary to build company towns at, at the mines that were close by. Yet some still were, but uh, other cases, everything had to be provided by the the mine owners or they wouldn't have any workers. Well, and back to Haydenville, you know, if you had a product like the tile, like the brick, you really could use your town as mm -hmm. a showplace of here's look at what we can do. You know, anybody interested in our tile, come see our town because it's all over the place. Yeah. Right. Very interesting. Uh, Jeff in Baltimore, you're on the air. Hi, Jeff. Uh, hi, Ann. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you. So, um, actually a couple of things I've been thinking of while I was sitting on hold here. Um, my first question had to do with the Bush family and their involvement with U.S. Steel and, and with um, with what, of course, eventually became Buckeye Steel and Columbus Castings in downtown Columbus um, and how they factor into the coal equation. But then also, being from Lancaster myself, I, I wonder about Anchor Hawking and how their demand factored into uh, the coal production in, hmm. in southeast Ohio. Okay. All right. Good questions, Jeff. Thanks. Yeah, we don't really uh, go into Buckeye Steel because that comes along later, or Anchor Hocking because our focus was more on Columbus and the development, the industrial development of Columbus. But yeah, Prescott Bush was well known for his involvement. He comes along kind of later in the story where we kind of leave off. Okay. The interesting thing is, is you know, as far as the you know the coal in uh, the the golden period of mining in Hocking Valley was from after the Civil War to the Depression. And even though, you know, I grew up knowing there was coal mining in central Ohio and, and it was really on the decline even then. Yeah. And you see, you know, like uh, Jeffrey Mining, which we talk about, you know, in one chapter. Jeffrey Mining, if they hadn't bought Galleon Manufacturing in 1928, as they came out of, you know, into the Depression, that's what kept them alive was Galleon Manufacturing, which made road building equipment because the whole coal industry is depressed. And so Jeffrey Mining, even though all of us remember it as a big mining company, in our lifetime it wasn't. <laughs> it was, that was, you know, on the decline even then. It was so, a sideline for them at that point. Yeah, it wasn't where they were making their money anymore. Right. That was the interesting thing earlier when you were talking to Elizabeth, that she was talking about the decline and how it's not going to go back to the way it was and the use of automation. In our book, we start talking about automation before 1870. Mm. That was one of the mm. issues of the strike is the owners were coming in and saying, we'd really like to automate this. And the workers were saying, well, now one man can do the job of two. That means you're going to fire half of us, right? And so it's so funny how everything that's old is new again and yeah. Listening to her talk, I was going, yeah, this is all in our book. It was just happening, right. you know, 150 years ago. Yeah, by 1910, Ohio was the leader in mechanized mining. So, and that was displacing people from, from jobs. And one of the, the big issues, you know, there's a lot of pain and suffering in the book, you know, during the strike periods. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the miners, you know, living under, you know, deplorable circumstances and most of it was due to the fact that we had too many miners. Mm -hmm. The mine owners said there was probably twice as many miners as they needed at any given time. So they were faced with either saying, we won't hire you. Instead, they'd hire them all, but they could only all work you know, half a job or third of a job. And so they couldn't make a living off of that. And there was always a fear of miners coming in um, from outside the state and even outside the country to, to kind of scab, basically, mm -hmm. if they were on strike. There's all these talk of, oh, they're going to be bringing them in from Europe. They're going to be bringing them in from, you know, all these different places to take our jobs. So it's really interesting how it's a very old story. Yeah. 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 The, the fear of the immigrant. <laughs> we are talking about coal in Ohio and uh, the uh, relationship it had with Columbus. 
on its growth. My guests, Elise Myers-Walker and also David Myers, are co-authors of the book Carrying Coal to Columbus, Mining in the Hocking Valley, co-authors, I should mention, with Nyla Vollmer. We will continue our conversation. This is All Sides with Ann Fisher on 89.7 NPR News. This is 89.7 NPR News. Thanks for joining us today. At noon, fresh air begins. Sunny with a high in the mid-40s this afternoon. A low of 32 tonight. Advertisers and marketers already track our shopping behavior online, but businesses are now tracking our behavior elsewhere through apps on our phones. They track how you're walking through the store, where you are, and can even change the price on goods. On the next Fresh Air, we talk with Joseph Turo about his new book, The Isles Have Eyes. Join us. Today at noon on 89.7 NPR News. Tom Asbrook. Coming up on the next On Point, Democrats are taking a page from the Tea Party as grassroots resistance to President Trump grows. We'll look at the movement. That's coming up on the next On Point from NPR. This afternoon at 1 on 89.7 NPR News. Support for the State House News Bureau stories heard today on 89.7 is provided in part by the Ohio Education Association, representing 120,000 members who work to inspire their students to think creatively and experience the joy of learning. Online at ohea.org. Welcome back to All Sides. We're talking about the history of coal in Ohio especially the impact that Columbus had on the industry in the early 19th century. Still with us are co-authors of a new book entitled Carrying Coal to Columbus, Mining in the Hocking Valley. Elise Myers-Walker and David Myers, uh, related uh, uh, father-daughter, daughter-father, um, by the way. Um, I'm the father. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case anyone would. Uh, what was it like to be, we, mentioned, we got into it a little bit, what it was like to be a coal miner in the earlier stages of the industry. It was a rough, deadly business. If you survived long enough to get black lung disease, I mean, it was, it was dangerous. Yeah, I mean, that just kind of gives you an indication of what the times were like. The fact that people were willing to take these jobs and consider them to be good jobs, especially during the times that the mining was thriving. But uh, we go into, in one chapter, just a description from the, the, the woman's side, just maintaining your house in the, in, at the coal mine and how you wake up in this morning and you've got the, the rings of soot around your nostrils and how you use tea leaves, wet tea leaves on the floor so you can sweep up the, the soot from coal because it just is everywhere. It's in the atmosphere. You're, yeah. you're breathing it. The coal and, dust was really incessant. Um, and we also talk about in that chapter, um, the gardens that the women had to keep because to supplement food basically for the family. Cause even though people were considering this a great job where you might die and you're probably going to get sick and there's dust everywhere. And there's also not enough money to feed your family. Um, they were, you know, really having to keep everything together. So it was a hard life for everybody involved in it. Yeah, probably the most poignant story and Part of the reason I needed to write this book is I ran across this account of a, a woman who recalled how her father went off to the mine every day. And when he came back, she was always happy to see him. And he, she would open his lunchbox and there would be a sandwich in there. And it was uh, just bread and butter. But she always got to eat that sandwich. And it was just such a, 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 a joyous memory for her until she learned later he packed that sandwich in case there was a cave in. So you'd have an extra meal. And so the so fact that he came home day. and it wasn't a sandwich, you know, you know there was a sandwich there. That, was good. that means it was a good day. Ed in Cape Coral, Florida, you're on the air. Hi, Ed. Uh, hi. Uh, hi, uh, David and Elise. Uh, I think, Dave, you might remember about 30 years ago, we were on a, on a work trip down in the Hocking Hills, and we uh, took a little detour to go past the Gem of Egypt, you know, yep. the huge steam shovel there. I was just wondering, uh, 
when strip mining became so big in Ohio, was that uh, if the, if you cover that at all in your book, and if, if and if they're still doing strip mining down there? Yeah, we don't really get into that too much because that's really after the the heyday, and it doesn't really apply to the area we're looking at. As counties over, but you know, you'll remember that we had the the big muskie, which was the the biggest strip mining shovel they ever built, and uh, in Muskingum County, right? Yeah, and they were so determined the, the the environmentalists when they decommissioned that that it would never be used again. They basically forced it to be dismantled. And I don't know if it's still there, but they, they kept the scoop part at the wilds. Yeah. Yeah. That's but, right. yeah, I remember that because they we were seeing – I think they were setting up to, to drive it across the highway at that time, weren't they, Ed? Um, yeah. Ed? Uh, yeah. They had to put uh, dirt over the yeah, highway, over the yeah. 70 to get it over, yeah. the, uh, over the highway. <laughs> yeah. Ed, thanks a lot for that call. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you. You bet. Bye. The United Mine Workers of America, as I mentioned earlier, was formed in Columbus. How did that come about? It was the culmination of a lot of stuff. I mean, the, it, basically it began years earlier in a place called uh, Robinson's Cave, which is in uh, New Straitsville, Ohio. It's of the early meetings of the groups like the Knights of Labor and... Uh, a lot of that, that was taking place everywhere where there was mining, but it seemed to be concentrated in Ohio. And you had you know, a guy named Chris Evans and another one named uh, John McBride who were real activists in that. And there were always these competing unions at the time or competing uh, workers' groups. And they found that that was kind of dysfunctional because they would you know, go out on strike, but they wouldn't have the support of the other groups. And so that weakened them in the end. And so eventually it was in one of their annual conventions of these uh, amalgamated groups you know, uh, in Columbus. They reached a decision to make, create the United Mine Workers, and John McBride was uh, chosen as the president at that time. So that all happened here, and it was because of the activism uh, among the miners in Ohio. Huh. And there's a plaque uh, right across from the state house that you can see right by the theater there that actually has the United Mine Workers yeah. founded here. By the Ohio Theater? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and the American Federation of Labor was formed here too, and before that. And John McBride was the first person to unseat, well, the only one, to unseat Samuel Gompers as president of the American Federation of Labor. And when he did that, he resigned as head of the United Mine Workers. So. So they were powerful here. Uh, they held a lot of sway. Huh. And even with that, and even with, they, they had to strike in 1884, 1885, where a lot of these efforts came out of that. And there was recognition then among the, the owners and the laborers that they couldn't do it that way again. It didn't change anything. And they continued to have strikes after strikes after strikes. And by the time, you know, you get, 1910 got half the miners are on strike at any given time so you just can't make a living that way john in plain city you're on the air hi john good morning ann um can you hear me yeah we can hear you great okay uh since your guest was just talking about the uh new straitsville area and the mm -hmm. and the cave there I'm wondering if they could make some comments about the mine fires. I'm so glad you <laughs> asked about that. I, I was I dying to talk about that. about that. Yeah. So, yeah, the new Straitsville mine fire um, in 1884, um, as part of the strike, a uh, car full of burning coal was pushed into the fire, uh, pushed into the mine and set everything ablaze. Um, mine fires are incredibly difficult to take care of. Um, there's really no safe way to fight them. And they have pretty much unlimited fuel. So the new Straitsville mine fire is still burning to this day. Again, started in uh, 1884. And as recently as 2003, uh, it's a lot of the area now is the Wayne National Forest. And they actually had um, some uh, smoke coming up through the ground. And, and they frequently find little pits of it. And when I was um, doing some studying down 
in uh, Nelsonville. I heard rumors that there are still some people in New Straitsville who don't have to pay for hot water. It just comes out of the tap warm. Yeah, I've heard of it too. We have an email from Mary Ann who says, New Straitsville, where my Irish ancestors settled at the height of the mining era, has a museum with many mining relics, and you can visit the site where miners held the first meeting that led to the union right. movement, which you referred to a little bit earlier, David Meyer. So, yeah, uh, if you're interested in this at all, absolutely go down there. Um, a number of these places have fantastic historical societies and experience it for yourself because there's great things. Yeah, we originally planned to do a book like this seven years ago. And that's when we first went down the area. And we were just so welcomed by the, the people. You know, we knew we were, had to do it. It didn't turn out quite the way we thought it would. But these are the, you know, the sons and daughters and grandchildren of miners. And they've opened up, you know, their, <laughs> their photographs and their, their letters and whatever they have to us so that we could use them in our book. And it's because they really are concerned about preserving their heritage. And there's, you know, it's sad to go to, you know, through a sound like Shawnee or, or um, New Straitsville mm -hmm. and see this really striking architecture, which was characteristic, this characteristic of the boom towns, uh, coal towns in Ohio, just crumbling apart. I mean, all these buildings that had, you know, uh, balconies on the second floors overlooking the streets and mm -hmm. things and uh and and to think that there are four thousand people lived here now and you know you there's probably not 75 you know if you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'd really like to see you know haydenville and new straitsville and shawnee and all these others something done to preserve some of it anyway uh you still got the theater you know that the knights of labor used you know the, um, in shawnee I know they've they've restored it, but there's other work to be done there. An email from Paul says, my uncle ran a coal mine during World War II and into the early 1950s in Muskingum County. He had one employee outside the family and two sons who worked it. I used to haul coal from it to families who had coal furnaces. Before he got electric equipment, he used ponies to haul it out. It was cold, damp, and claustrophobic. Hmm. So there's somebody. And then also from an uh, email from Cynthia she says, I visited an old mining operation near Coonville last week, which has been closed for years. The streams surrounding the site are still bright orange with chemical runoff, and there is not much life in them. Yeah, that's tr you'll see that a lot in the streams in there. And part of the, you know, the, the stream recovery has been going on. They've, they're doing some interesting things in order to leach those poisonous uh, chemicals out of them. But, yeah, that's, unfortunately, that is the kind of the, the legacy of operating those mines and then you know, closing them down with no one being held accountable for right. it. Is that... You know, you wrote that the golden age of coal mining spanned the era between the Civil War and World War II, really the Depression. Depression. And I'm wondering what changed after World War II. Were they able to just invest more money in the mechanization of mining at that point? That, or and there's what? more competition, you know, okay. other coal fields opening up. Uh, to me, you know, Almost every book I write goes back to a book I was given when I was a child called uh, Ohio Builds a Nation by Samuel Hardin Stiles. And I was just intrigued by that notion that Ohio was responsible for doing so much. And I kind of grew up believing that. And so I keep looking for examples of it. And when you write a book like this, you'll find out, you know, like the, the iron making that came out of those iron furnaces. Over 60% of the armament that was created during the Civil War came from those iron furnaces. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, 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 you know, add in our generals, and you know, there couldn't have been yeah, a Civil War without, them, without Ohio. Yeah, yeah without the <laughs> troops. But it's, it's that kind of thing that we lose track of because, you know, now then we became a Rust Belt state, and then we become flyover country. And and it's, it's kind of the same way, but on a, a, a microeconomic uh, scale. What's going on in those little communities down there that these people are trapped in these failing communities mm -hmm. because nothing was ever brought in to replace it. You know, it's been taken away from them, but, you know, they, they're tied to their land because that's the only possession that they have. And they can't sell it because nobody wants it. And so, you know, the option is just turn your back on it and leave or try to stay there and tough it out. And so that's why, it, you know, you'd like... Maybe tourism is the answer because there's so much to see down there if it was developed.
You know, 15 years ago when I was covering the region, they were talking about the little cities of the Black Diamond and and, and getting a tourism industry going. And that hasn't really succeeded, Elise Myers-Walker. Why not? Uh, you know, I don't know because I'm there almost every weekend and I love it. <laughs> right. um, I I think I think there's got to be an initial investment. Um, like my father said, a lot of the buildings are still there, but they're crumbling. So somebody right. would need to come in and put the money in to repair them to fix them up and then to attract people there um definitely tourism is doing well in the hawking hills mm-hmm. area um so you know maybe on your way stop at one of those local museums but um uh, yeah we would absolutely love to see more going on there and i think it is a a great place to to check out um i also think americans maybe we we do those day trip driving a lot less than we used to um i i don't know many other people that go, we're going to hop in a car and try to find the ruins of a town that's not there anymore. Um, it's my reality, but it's not <laughs> most people's. So, uh, again, I would encourage everybody to go and, you know, maybe we can turn it around if enough people go and tell other people to go and have fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people know it exists, but they don't know what its significance is. And so they don't think about it as they're driving through. You know, it's just another run downtown. And uh, I, in, unless you've got this, you know, love of history, I don't know how you instill that in people. But we write books to try to get the message out, that, you know, hoping to win some converts. There's, there's also not the same um, sort of Amish presence that you see in other parts of the state. There is some, but I know a lot of people, when they do their agritourism, they want to go see where the Amish are, and that's not as prominent in this area. Right. Right. But I think the, uh, the you know, the Col- Carrie and Cold of Columbus, you titled it for that, you know, on purpose. And that was Columbus's role and all of this. And it's more important than I even I, you know, and I covered the area for a while than I realized until I read your book. Yeah. Well, we we owe that section of Ohio something. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we've been fortunate. Columbus is thriving. We owe them something. And uh, what I would like to, you know, that you need an angel for those things to be revived. I, I look to, I can, my mother was from New Bremen, Ohio, hmm. and it would be another nothing little town except for the presence of Crown Control. And the Dickey family just put their money back into New Bremen hmm. and they bought the downtown and they bought, you know, 70 some houses and they just keep restoring things. And that's what they've chosen to do with the profits from that company. And I, I wish that there were other companies that, you know, look the uh, same way. And, you know, we, we took from here. Now let's give back. David Myers, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. David Myers, co-author of Carrying Coal to Columbus, Mining in the Hockey Valley. And Elise Myers-Walker, thanks to you as well. I appreciate Thank you. it. Elise Myers-Walker, co-author of Carrying Coal to Columbus, Mining in the Hocking Valley. Thanks for your calls and your emails today. And thanks for listening. This is All Sides with Ann Fisher on 89.7 NPR News.